a huge round of applause, please, for Alexis Richardson. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Happy to be here. Let me know if you can't hear at the back, etc. So today's topic is what is cloud native and why should I care? Why should you care? Why should anyone care? So let's just answer that now. Um, it is cloud open source cloud computing for applications. And the CNCF, which I'm part of, I'm the, the chairman of the technical oversight committee for the CNCF, as well as being Weaveworks CEO and co-founder, exists to provide a complete and trusted toolkit for modern architectures. That's it, so I've answered the question and we can all get the beers now. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's more. Yeah. Who am I? Um, I mentioned Weaveworks. I've done a few other things before, mostly to do with open source product companies, um, including running the Spring team for a while, was responsible for what became Spring Boot, uh, previously did things at VMware involving Rabbit, Redis, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack. Previously, I was the CEO and founder of RabbitMQ, and I've done some other things as well. Some of these companies are even still going. So we had this customer that wanted to move its application into the cloud. To do that, they had to create a duplicate of the application, run it on Amazon as a DR. And this is the, one of the first, if not the first, really, really big financial services companies moving a critical application into the cloud. And they did so using containers for portability, so they've got the same app running in containers on metal in their data center and in containers in the cloud on Amazon. So this is a production use case of a large-scale business critical application from a major company enabled by containers and cloud-native technology, which is why this is so important and why we'll be talking about it today. The thing that they like is what they call invisible infrastructure. The idea that they can focus on their application, not on tools. So that's a really important lesson, and we'll have a few more of these lesson slides. Invisible infrastructure. Ca customers want to migrate apps into the cloud, keep some behind the firewall. They want to change cloud providers. They don't want to be locked into Amazon. They want to move back into their data center, maybe move on to Google. And they want everything to just work so they can focus on their app. So the question is, how can we enable that? And it's not a one company thing. This is a ecosystem-wide, community-wide thing that everybody is involved with. Because ultimately, lots and lots and lots of applications that uh, people in this room and, and your friends will build will have these kinds of requirements in the future. And we're, what we're doing is we're recapping on techniques pioneered by big web companies like Netflix. I personally think that it's just amazing how Netflix can work in a hotel room with a dodgy broadband nowadays. I mean, they've really got it right in terms of their delivery. This slide is from a few years ago. I highly recommend looking at it. Amazon Web Services reInvent, um, really setting out what, they, what Netflix see as the kind of key criteria of cloud native, which for them is it's used by consumers. Real people are using this, so it has to be available. People get really annoyed if things break. It's global, their customers are all over the world, and it's web scale, which you know you, we can laugh about that, MongoDB, teddy bears, and so forth. But actually, um, for Netflix, this really does mean that they can keep on adding capacity whenever they like, anywhere in the system, which led them down a certain path. And you know, the payoff from a business point of view, you know, in, in the CEO office, so to speak, is their increasing availability while at the same time increasing their ability to change all their applications, which is one of the characteristics of this new breed of modern applications and architectures and practices, that teams in, in particular in Silicon Valley, but elsewhere as well, are able to respond to customer requests more or less as they come in. You know, Airbnb can get an email from a disgruntled customer like me saying, I went to this web page and the picture was wonky, and you know the feedback form didn't work. And they can change that, and if the change doesn't work, they can roll it back instantly, and at the same time keeping up the system for everybody else, which gives them a huge advantage over people like sort of you know Marriott and, and intercontinental hotels, which is why these people are so frightened of companies like Airbnb. 
And so this is why, and here's the picture of the horrible egghead, people like Mark Andreessen say, software is eating the world. Because it you know, truly is the case that software, which used to be you know, essentially treated as a cost center by large companies, is now seen as a source of intellectual property, business value, and profit. Because you can make your customers happy by using software if you adopt the practices of companies like Netflix that they call cloud native. So businesses want to do this. And so this is why anyone can raise money now to go off and be a cloud native company in Silicon Valley. But you know, jokes aside, if you look at the numbers, you can see some pretty startling differences. So this is from um, Puppet Labs, State of DevOps, an annual report they do, quite a, quite a high quality survey mm -hmm. uh, from 2015, comparing what they think of as the leaders and the laggards in their distribution in terms of things like deployment frequency, mean time to recovery. And as you can see, mean time to recovery has gone in a year from 48 times difference between somebody who's good at this stuff and somebody who's not to 168 times difference. And that's truly astonishing. That probably means, you know, if your site goes down, you can fix it in five minutes versus your customers are offline for hours. And the deployment lead time of 200x, I mean, this is the difference between companies that struggle to make small changes to their website versus people who change things continuously. So you know, this is something you can quantify. And that's why people get so excited about unicorns, but in reality, the rest of the world is still trying to catch up. So cloud native is something that everybody thinks is important, everyone is aware of, but then how are we going to democratize it? How are we gonna make this technology available to everybody, not just an elite of um, nerds in Silicon Valley. So I'm gonna do a little case study around our own experience trying to become a cloud native company. So at Weaveworks, we have an application uh, called Weave Cloud, which we run on EC2. We wanna run it on other clouds. And the purpose of it is to give you monitoring management for cloud native applications to make it easy. And so we decided that it didn't make sense for us to have customers who were trying to adopt cloud native without having adopted the practices ourselves. And so that's what we did. We re-architected our app to be cloud native. And this is what it currently looks like. So what have we got here? There's some microservices up here for managing the core website. There's a whole observability stack down here at the core of which is Prometheus and Weave Scope. There is a multi-tenanted monitoring service based on Prometheus of the new thing we've written for Frankenstein. And there's a whole set of data services up here. And one thing that's very important about this for us is that at no point in this diagram do we mention Amazon. Well, actually we don't. We mention it here. We're gonna get rid of that soon. But we wanna be able to say that. But we also don't mention Kubernetes, which we happen to be running on. Because this is about focusing on our application it also has other elegant properties, like all the different parts in a microservices style are independent of one another. So that means that if we want to take a piece down and repair it while the other pieces stay up, we can do that. We can scale these pieces independently. So if we see growth here, but not here, or here, but not here, we can adapt to that. And all of these things basically mean that we can manage costs down and keep profit up. And these were our lessons from this, our key points. You know, this is a highly available Netflix style app, 24 seven, does all the things, it's secure, it's automated. And we focus on the application, not on Kubernetes itself. We can run any component anywhere, well not quite, because there's a few Amazon services we're still tied to. All the pieces work together. You know, the Prometheus piece talks to Docker, it talks to Kubernetes. And we can get rid of Kubernetes, it's everything is pluggable. So this is actually quite a good example of the set of requirements that other people might be looking at. Because other people too want to align revenue with cost. Other people too want the ability to scale. Other people too want the ability to move some or all of the application to another cloud or behind the data center. They don't want to be tied into one cloud, one orchestrator. And they want to choose tools that just work together. They don't want to have to do the integration themselves. This is another piece of our app showing what we call the ABCDE of deployment. 
We are able to do this automated deployment in a way that allows us to swap out any particular piece shown here. So right now we're using a Key in Coros as our container image repo, and we're using Circle CI for our builds, and we're deploying to Kubernetes. But we can swap these in and out as needed. And this is really, I mean, perhaps this is taking buggability too far, but it does give us tremendous confidence that we can use this architecture going forward indefinitely, because we can swap things in and out as we like. We have a full life cycle and a scalable application, a la Netflix, that we can move around. So what do we learn from this example? To do this cloud native, web scale, available thing, we need good tools. We want them to be open source because we don't want to be tied to one provider. We want to run them anywhere. We want to run, run them on Amazon, we want to run them on Google Cloud, we want to run them on software, we want to run, run them on behind the firewall on VMware, let's say, or on Metal. The particular pieces of software that we are cho choosing need to be ones that we can trust. And we need to feel the teams that are working on them, like the Prometheus team, can look after this software for a long period of time, potentially you know, years and years and years. And we need everything to be monitorable and controllable. You know, this needs to be thought about at the beginning of the process of constructing the component, not at the end. And all the tools, tools need to work together. And so we were able to make these decisions for ourselves, but what I believe is that you know, the further away you get from people who are right at the cutting edge, the harder this becomes. So you know, Cloud Native and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which I'll talk about a bit later, are all about giving people guidance, clarity, a common set of tools that they can use to solve this problem as we did, but without having to go through the struggle that we did together. Another lesson, which is very important, and we'll come back to it a little later, is you know, the infrastructure has to be boring if you want to focus on your app. Boring is good here. You know, there are lots of different people saying, we have the great platform that you can run everything on. Some platform as a service, containers as a service, different container-based things, Mesosphere, Coros Tectonic, you know, these are all good platforms, but you know, use the one you like, but it's got to be boring, it's got to be in the background because you want to focus on your app. And the one thing to watch out for here with these boring platforms is what I call the 1% failure problem. So, uh, you know, earlier on, we had a conversation about uh, you know, Docker in the, uh, in the panel. And you know, one of the issues for Docker is they're being accused at the moment, perhaps a little unfairly because some of the cases are a bit uh, unusual, of instability because they're pushing really hard to add new features quickly to make customers happy. And as a result, they may not be paying as much attention to what's going on in the back office, keeping the software stable, safe and secure for everybody who's already running it. Breaking changes on APIs, that sort of thing. And you know, that's okay if you're at small scale. But if you have a piece of software that behaves weirdly 1% of the time because, you know, Lib Network, for example, has some funny ideas about, you know, cleaning up IP addresses or something, then when you get to the stage of people using this stuff seriously and starting potentially thousands of containers a day, that, contain, that turns into hundreds of incidents a year where the developers owning the system have a problem and have no idea what is causing it. And it's the same thing with Netflix. When I showed you that chart of pushing to the right on rate of change and pushing up in terms of availability. You know, why go from 99% to 99.9 or 99? Because Netflix have so many users that even 1% failures lead to, you know, very, very large numbers of incidents that they just can't cope with. So you know, be aware that platforms, when I say they need to be boring, I mean they need to be really boring. They can't be 99% boring. Okay. And the last lesson that we learned is, because we made this stuff up as we went along, we need good patterns. You know, microservices is one pattern. We probably overdid it a bit on microservices in our application. We find that sometimes a monolith is good, or as I like to call it, a microlith, if it's just a small piece of software that's HA or something like that. Cattle not pets is a pattern. The pattern, there are a whole load of observability patterns, and the, then there's also the tra classic traffic patterns. Blue-green deployment, canary. Canary is when you deploy a patch to your system and divert a proportion of your traffic to it to, to validate that patch. And then all of your traffic over, if you're happy with the patch, and you roll away the patch and divert all the traffic back, 
you're unhappy with the patch. And all of these are patterns that many of the big web companies have learned about in the last 10 or 15 years. There are great books about this, like Release It by Michael Nygaard, which is nearly 10 years old, actually. You know, if you follow Adrian Cockcroft, who I think spoke here last year, you know, a lot of what he talks about relates to these patterns. And when you talk to um, tech teams and businesses that are adopting cloud-native microservices, I often find what they really want to do is get, is get their heads around this, because this is what's creating the value for them, more uptime, less downtime quicker mean time to recovery. And so if nothing else, cloud native for me is patterns. It's about establishing the patterns that you need to be highly available, automated, etc. And there's the obligatory picture of Adrian, just to recognize that he talks about this enough for, for us to be aware of it, and it's generally a great guy. A little break. Any quick questions? No? Good, okay. So, all right, that's all very well. But why should I care? Just to repeat, open source cloud computing for applications, not infrastructure like OpenStack. That's supposed to be boring. I hear that it's not boring enough. Maybe it's a little bit too interesting for some people. But this is about applications, it's not infrastructure. A complete and trusted toolkit for modern architectures for applications based around patterns for availability, automation, acceleration, and running things anywhere, which translates into various sort of technology concepts. CICD. Anyone who's doing this stuff without doing CICD, they've got a homegrown build automation system rather than off the shelf one, is probably slightly crazy. Run things anywhere. Containers, one thing that makes them exciting is they're portable. No longer do we have the, you know, will it run on Linux, Windows, Amazon, or VMware question that we had with the VMs. This is a huge step forward. And so what are the patterns to make that into applications? So then you need software. Here's an example of some software. I'll talk more about this in detail later on. But this is uh, the kind of software we're talking about here. Monitoring software. Tracing software, logging software, and the key one, of course, orchestration software, service discovery, configuration management, all of these things are things that you need when you're running at scale in the way that I have described. So there's actually quite a lot of software that you need to put together to give people a complete tool set for cloud native. Okay. So let's say we have the software. Great. What about this foundation stuff? Why do we need a foundation? Do I care about foundations? What even is a foundation? Does anyone know? Does anyone care? Is it this? For those of you, for the younger members of the audience, this is a picture of uh, Harry Seldon, who is the robot in the foundation trilogy, or is it Six Sex Allergy? I don't know, by Isaac Asimov, yeah. in which it turns out that uh, economists and mathematicians are the best people to run society. Anyway, is the foundation some sort of federation of collaborating powers? And the answer is, yeah, it is both of these things, because the foundation lets people like eBay and Airbnb and Netflix work with Google and Amazon and IBM, and this is something that's actually very hard to do. They don't trust each other, so they need a mechanism to work together sometimes if they want to share code that's meant to be boring. Is it some hippie thing? Kind of. I just went to the Linux conference last week. It was definitely a hippie thing. But some of the hippies were a little old, though. They had that really funky kind of bald ponytail look. <laughs> The Linux Foundation is a cool thing, though. 25 years old last week. Three cheers for Linux. There was a time when people thought Linux wouldn't last, and Microsoft would say, Linux, you shouldn't use that. You can still find these people on the register, by the way, in the comment section. So, the Linux Foundation has, kind of, in my view, three purposes. One, 
It safeguards Linux for the long term and brackets and a bunch of other projects as well. Two, it provides that crucial nexus for collaboration and trust, that hippie thing that makes it possible for big companies that may not like each other to work together on boring things. And three, it is kind of cool. It's an ubiquitous open source brand. You don't have to explain it to many people anymore. And this is a good thing for customers and the community because it means we can all benefit because people know this is software that has got a blessing of quality, mostly. <laughs> and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a subset of the Linux Foundation. So the way the Linux Foundation is organized is it's kind of an umbrella and it has a single legal infrastructure which is shared across the different sub-foundations which cover different elements of the big picture. There's one for sort of blockchain now, there's one for um, containers, there's one for PaaS, there's a bunch of other ones that I couldn't list for you. And so we're not talking just about open source, but this is a key distinction. We are talking about common open source, not proprietary open source. So there was a time when, you know, RabbitMQ, which I mentioned I founded, was a proprietary open source company. The company retained all the copyright to its software and was the sole developer, supporter, and committer to the software. And that was by design. And that meant that we could support and build a business around the idea that we have the sole control of the project. That's a really good business model. Problem is, and it's used by, for example, Mongo, it's, 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 it's respectful, respectable. The thing is, the more big companies like Airbnb and eBay and Google and IBM, A, want to get into the game, and B, understand how to do it, and C, go ahead and actually get on with it, the more that the, the center of gravity shifts away from single creators of software to a commons. And really that is the future. The commons can take place in two ways. It can happen through foundations, where there might be an element of regulation, or it can happen out in places like GitHub in an unregulated manner. And over time what you find is sometimes projects decide, well, being unregulated was kind of fun for a few years, but now everyone hates each other. <laughs> so let's try something else. And that's what happened with Node. They forked. They loved each other so much they split into two and pointlessly roamed the wilderness for two years. And then they got back together and there was a huge hug. And they said, we are one again, but we should write down what we care about. Okay, so I mentioned software is eating the world. We shall now have a humorous picture about that. Open source is eating software. Open source is a good thing. But the problem is, cloud is also eating open source. You know, Amazon, 10 billion of revenue, it's an amazing company, I'm talking about the cloud here, by the way. Um, but they do things like Amazon MapReduce, which is not called what it actually is, which is a Hadoop-like system. And they do this with Memcache, they do it with other things. And you know, there's an element of um, concern that in the future there may be three or four cloud providers, all of whom have propri proprietary large-scale services. And that will lead to an alternative form of lock-in. Someone will write software that works on Amazon, it'll start using those services, but they won't be able to port it to Google. And so, without a common set of tools that solve the problems of cloud native, we, the customers, the end users, risk being locked in. Now, I actually like Amazon services. I mentioned earlier, we actually still are using them in some of our app. It's a good thing. But, you know, this issue of locking is a real issue because nobody wants to find that they can't move away from a cloud if something does go wrong. It is a worrying situation. So, for whom is this a concern apart from me? Uh, well, a few years ago, the people who moaned about locking were other software vendors. And no one cares what they think. But then, big companies like eBay and Airbnb started to kind of find that they were using Amazon a lot and sometimes decided, oh, we're going to get off Amazon now because it's too damn expensive, that we've actually got so much going on that we'd rather just move everything back in-house. It's cheaper to have our own data center. You've seen that a few times. Um, Netflix, a few years ago, launched a brand called Netflix OSS to bring all of their different open source projects into one common umbrella. Sounds a bit like a commons. 
And they did this because they wanted to, other people to contribute to their software and build up, wait for it, a common set of tools that everyone could use that and trust for building Netflix-type architectures. Because Netflix wanted to know they could move to Google Cloud or IBM Cloud or uh, Azure Cloud, perhaps, you know, if they had to. They like Amazon a lot, but they just wanted to tell Amazon, listen, guys, we love you, but we can move. So don't jack up your prices too much, please. And so that was a very important change. And now even kind of, forgive me if anyone works for such a company, but traditional companies, for example, European banks. I know that there are some people here from European banks. <laughs> I was speaking to one last week from Norway. They said, our strategy is Amazon plus one, meaning we actually want to use the cloud now, but we want to have the ability to go to one other thing. It could be our own data center, or it could be another cloud. So they've woken up to this too. They get the purpose of the cloud, the flexibility of having the option to do more, manage costs through that, but now they also want the flexibility to go away. So that means pretty much everybody now wants this kind of boring stuff to be in common in the open so they can use it if possible rather than getting locked in. <clears throat> that creates a tremendous momentum behind this need for a tool set that I mentioned before. What is cloud native? Open source cloud computing for applications. A common and trusted toolkit for modern architectures. For end users, it's easy, it's fast, no confusion about what to use, no lock-in, guidance and clarity on what cloud native means, what the patterns are, a badge of trust around the project, and all shared through a foundation. And so right now, CNCF, which did not exist a year ago, really only kind of got going about nine months ago, took on its first project in March, was announced at KubeCon in London, and we've had, uh, that was Kubernetes, and then Prometheus joined, and we're looking at a bunch of other projects at the moment. And if anyone in the audience feels that they want to talk to me about that particular aspect, please come and find me later, or indeed about anything at all. So we're early stage, but the point is, each one of these tools should be something you can trust. And like a toolkit, sometimes there's two of them in the box. Two screwdrivers, because they have different shaped heads. One is good for one thing, another for another. Doesn't mean that you're saying, oh, well, Prometheus is going to be the only monitoring system that matters in the future, because we all know that's not true. And more importantly, perhaps, Kubernetes is not necessarily going to be the one orchestration system. I think it's doing really well but some people want to use Mesos and DCOS, not Kubernetes, or some people want to use them together. And what about Docker Swarm? And what about some things that are less well known, like CloudSoft's AMP platform? There's lots of lots of cool stuff out there. And so gradually we're starting to understand what this world might look like. And I mentioned all the different types of software earlier. We've tried to organize it into a kind of stack. We are worried about the orange layers at the top. They are not colored orange because we're in Amsterdam. <laughs> Broadly speaking, containers, orchestration and management, and the microservices patterns at the top. The one that says networking is out of scope here, by the way, to preempt the question that will come at the end. This is referring to provider networking, a la Amazon network or Google network, not software networks. So just to run through this stack a little bit for you, to give you some sense of you know, the importance and depth here, the patterns, there's a whole load of important tools that you need to implement the patterns. Composition tools, application deployment tools, CI, CD, image registries are a big thing right now. Then you have management. This is probably the biggest area. I mean, there's so much going on here. I mentioned this earlier, but you know, things like, uh, just take something like traffic management, service management. How do you do smart routing between different nodes of a service in order to do blue green deployment effectively? A lot of different solutions for this. Which ones are the good ones? How do you choose one? Should you choose console and do it yourself using a handcrafted solution, or you should you use a special purpose tool like Buoyant, LinkedIn, like or just use Kubernetes and rely on their built-in router? And the runtime, which is probably the most contested area, uh, because he who or she who controls this layer may control the whole thing. Hence the concerns about, about Docker that we mentioned earlier. Scheduling, laying out containers, joining them up into networks, 
giving them the ability to write data to disk in a useful manner that's retained, copied, and so on. And then the, the sort of PaaS governance that sometimes goes with that. And going a bit further down the stack, and sort of leaving the scope of CNCF somewhat, things like security for image management on machines, provisioning. And then the bit that we definitely don't do, which is the cloud stuff. Amazon, VMware, OpenStack, and so on. Okay. So a common set of tools, but not, but not, but not, but not standards. We're not a standards organization, okay? There are good standards organizations that know how to do standards like IETF, ISO. What is a standard? In my opinion, having been involved in a few standards, a standard is an algorithm for identifying areas of disagreement between different parties and then amplifying them because all they want to do is standardize the one thing they really, 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 really care the most about. So everyone says, well, we agree about all of this, but this, this bit, you guys just don't get it, do you? Well, no, you're wrong. I saw this a few years ago with something called AMQP, which RabbitMQ implemented. There was just Red Hat wanted to do it one way, and everybody else wanted to do it another way, and we spent two years arguing about it, and then somebody re rewrote the, sta the standard and said, well, now here's a new standard that does both. I actually did nothing. Let's bless this. And this is a kind of preposterous waste of time that makes everyone unhappy. <laughs> So standards are slow, they lead to arguments, you need patience and they emerge slowly. We don't need that. What we need is interoperability. We need companies like WeaveWorks to go, oh, I'm gonna use Prometheus, FluentD, and Kubernetes and they'll just work together. Or they'll work together with a little bit of effort. They work together because they've, there's some conventions that they're circling around in the community, which might be, for example, we, had a, we mentioned CNI earlier, a simple convention for talking about networks in the setting of a container. People who want to turn these into standards can go ahead and take a specification and document writing this up and, and, and try and take it to a standards body like the IETF and spend five years battling everybody who wants to disagree with them. Because as soon as you say this is a candidate standard, you can guarantee that at least three people will come along and argue with you until you've given up, because that's what they like to do. So really, what we're trying to do is get going with a few projects. As we build on more projects, start to consolidate the brand for interoperability and start to make the brand something that customers can go, ah, cloud native, I want that. I don't want that other thing. And then maybe some standards will emerge from that over time. Okay. How are we doing? All right. Is Docker cloud native? You should know the answer by now, of course. I thought I'd say a few things about Docker because they've been in the news recently. Yes, they have. Docker is part of the CNCF. I personally am happy with their role in the CNCF, just to be completely clear. Oh, I really mean that. Bob Wise is a really cool guy who runs the Samsung Cloud team um, Samsung Technology Services Cloud Team out of Seattle. And he posted a blog last week, which I've linked to here, uh, called An Ode to Boring, basically lamenting the fact that uh, it didn't seem possible for Docker to play nice in some areas with other people in the community, including vendors and some end users, apparently. I'm not quite sure about that. And one of the issues that was coming up a lot was stability. The idea that in, in an attempt to build out features quickly to claim um, areas of the platform higher up the stack in the ref stack that I showed you. Docker was breaking features lower down that still mattered and consequently leading to application breakages. Remember I said the 1% problem, if 1% of the time Docker lets you down, and by the way I'm not saying it does, but if it did happen, you'd have a lot of outages if you were using Docker hundreds of thousands of times a year. And they would probably be quite confusing because they're down in the boring bit that no one's supposed to care about. And here's Bob saying, I call on the CNCF. It's very exciting. We need a transparent, community-driven implementation. So he's saying we need a common open source model instead of a single vendor open source model. I was really, really happy to see this. You know, this is me. Being called upon. 
So what is being called for, apparently? Well, three things. Um, the standard piece, which is handled by OCI, which is a sister foundation to, um, to the CNCF, that is the definition of a core standard container. What is disputed there is the scope of that. There are also accusations about uh, some members stuffing it with features while other members um, basically block any new features being added, naming no names. Stability, I think, is a, is a new concern that has come out since Docker 1.12 was released and made quite a few changes. Um, you know, I personally have no view on this, but I'm sure that you as users of containers may have a view. And finally, this is one that's been running for a while. To be an open platform, which basically means that it's not solely under the control of Docker, that it's actually easy to plug in all kinds of third-party software. And in particular, and this is the big one, that orchestration providers can plug in their own orchestration systems instead of Docker Swarm and get it working and sell the whole thing to customers without anyone getting unhappy. And that third thing is sort of somewhat theoretical right now because what Docker have done is they've introduced Swarm as a standard option in Docker itself and that has led to, and that and some other design issues have made it harder to plug things in. And I'm, I'm being quite careful what I say because I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be in the position of representing Docker's opinion because I'm sure they have a very strong opinion about all these things which I'm sure makes a lot of sense nor do I want to represent the opinion of some of the people who've complained recently. I'm just highlighting it as an issue. And here's what the world would look like if Docker was the only runtime platform. So you can see this is why people are saying the CNCF could play a role in helping here, because what we care about is a common set of tools for building cloud applications that are pluggable and interoperable. So if, they, if that were true, then you can imagine plugging things around Docker, and Docker would be happily to build, building their own platform out of those components. But at the moment, what's disputed is there's control over the whole stack. So this, this is something which is in area of tension. And what's at stake, this is my last slide, what's at stake is, do you want to be locked into a new container layer? So we've got this amazing thing where Docker, awesomely, is portable across Linux, Windows, Amazon, and VMware. People have been looking for this for years and years and years. It's very exciting. Now we can have a common cloud across everything. We just deploy stuff to it. Do you want that to be controlled by a single vendor or not? Is it going to be one platform, one vendor, monopoly world, or competition? Would that be better based on common plumbing? And so, you know, the CNCF very, very much hopes that we can continue to work with Docker to achieve something that's fair to everybody introduces enough competition in the plumbing that you know, people have choice, keeps it work working together in a sufficiently boring way, and lets platform vendors like Docker still make money. So there you go. That's what Cloud Native is. Open source cloud computing for applications. A trusted toolkit for modern architectures. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have time for a few questions. Who's first? Has the beer arrived? That didn't go as I expected it to. Um, there we go, Adrian. Adrian, one of the Adrians. Sorry to sort of top of my head, but so are you looking to foster more projects? Is there a possibility of getting things like Rocket into um, CNCF? Some people have suggested that container implementations, e.g. Rocket, could be in the CNCF. There has not been any proposal though. So the process involves writing down that a project should be in the CNCF, posting on the public mailing list, and having people comment. So until then, everything remains in the state of kind of rumor and speculation. Um, and you would be open to the uh, container runtime? I think it's possible, yeah. Thank you. Any more for any more? Next nice question. Yeah. Okay, fuck it. It's the end of the day. I'm going for it. You mentioned stability. I did. And that's a good thing. But you focus only on Docker. Chad. That's do true. Think, uh, don't you think it's also interesting to pursue stability to address it also for the other parts of the stack? I do think that's important. Um, were you at the panel this morning? For, yeah. Yeah. I mean, people who are calling for a Docker fork, um, you know, I, I would say to them, be careful what you wish for. 
because it might be possible to come up with an alternative container engine or a fork or something. I personally think this is a terrible idea, but supposing it happened, you might end up with something which solves the problems that people are complaining about while introducing loads of new instabilities elsewhere. And it is completely wrong to say that all of this software is stable. It's just false. So I agree with you. Any more questions? Um, do you consider also the ecosystems uh, of the cloud platforms? So you don't run the services yourself, but you take them as hosted services. And those which are then cross-cloud. Yeah, I mean, Google posted a blog post about this in their cloud blog a few weeks ago, saying you shouldn't use cloud services that are tied to one platform. You should use cloud open source software that is running on our cloud and run as a service for you. So let's take um, you know, messaging, for example. You know, run RabbitMQ on Google and we can manage it for you. And then it's Rabbit as a service, but you should then be able to port that to something else, as opposed to something like Amazon SQS or Amazon SNS. I think it's probably a pretty critical question for databases, because obviously data portability is a huge problem for application portability. But um, you know, if the CNCF is successful, I think you'll see uh, lots of big infrastructure cloud providers adopting the software that the CNCF is identifying and promoting. So, for example, Prometheus, you know, I expect big cloud providers to offer Prometheus services at some point, probably in partnership with startups. Hi. Um, the quick question I had was if we assume that buying into Docker is uh, vendor lock in, then how is using Weave to sort of glue everything together not also lock in? Well, this is, this is a ridiculous thing. I mean, of course it's, it's vendor lock in. I mean, Every, every time you touch a piece of software and you make a custom modification with respect to it, you are introducing a debt that you'll have to pay later if you want to move away from that piece of software. There's no question about that. So, you know, one person's lock-in, one person's freedom is another person's lock-in. Um, but it manifests itself in different ways. It's a question of, you know, whether rents are going to be charged. So, if one of the primary areas of um, payment is around the orchestrator, and that's tied to the container, and when you use the container, you're guided to, towards picking a certain orchestrator, and it's difficult to use the others, and then sort of kind of somehow you end up sort of spending money on that, then that's the kind of lock-in that makes people nervous. But if you use a piece of software and like it and go, well, you know, okay, this is, this is, this is, I can also use other management products alongside this, for example, without ripping this out. That's a different sort of uh, commitment. So there isn't one kind of lock-in, but I think, you know, it's a very fair point. A few years ago, I mentioned Spring. A few years ago, Spring introduced a no lock-in concept for Java application servers, which nobody wanted to be locked into. But of course, they ended up using Spring as a standard Java API. And that became very successful for Spring, but, but Spring didn't go around you know, trying to dip into everybody's wallet. So it was less bothersome. We have time for one more question. Uh, are you planning to compile uh, some list of, uh, let, let's say you, you suggest this and that tooling for uh, um, for, for cloud, uh, are you planning to, uh, to test that tooling uh, against different clouds? And then, uh, so if I'm as an end user, I go to your website, and I know that this tool works with this, this, this cloud, but it does work with others. Yes. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, we well, beat me to it, so I guess that was the second round of applause for Alexis, or should we do another one? Another one! Yeah. Another one.